Good morning. Welcome to this special webinar heralding the start of HealthFest 2021. Today, under the theme of Reflect and Recover, we'll be letting you know about the activities in store over the coming month and looking back on the past year. In a brief moment, Trust Chair David Walker will open proceedings. But before he does so, I'd like to introduce you to today's panel, who are Chief Executive Dr Nick Broughton, COVID Operations Director Tamina Ajmal, Sophie Grimshaw, Project Lead for Enf Enhanced Occupational Health and Wellbeing, Kerry Rogers, Director of Corporate Affairs, and Judy Pink, Head of Charity and Involvement. I'm Sarah Taylor, Head of Communications. Following presentations, we'll be putting your questions to the panel. You can post your questions using, using the Q&A function in the top right hand side of your screen, as shown on this slide. And we'll endeavour to post to answer all your questions, but in the event we're unable to do so, we will follow this up with the after the event. So now it's time to hand over to the chair of our trust, David Walker. David. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thanks to your team for making this event uh, possible. So good morning and welcome to Health Fest 2021. Now, the pandemic still rages and we're facing its consequences for mental health and the continuing organisation, perhaps permanent now, of mass vaccination. The virus we know has killed many thousands, disrupted the economy, stretched NHS staff to breaking point and beyond. But, a cautious but, there are positives, such as this, this, this event, a new capacity to come together virtually, saving time and carbon generating travel. We've learnt a lot about ourselves as an organisation, as people, as communities. Oxford Health is its staff. You who do the caring, administer the therapies, you who maintain our laptops, who clean the ward floors, who do the research, who run the foot clinics. It's a long and diverse list. Now, unless you are well and relatively content, this thing, this organisation, this health service doesn't work. So your health, in the widest sense, your well-being are preconditions of our functioning. And of course, we have to be realistic. Your well-being depends in part on your pay, on your ability to afford to pay rent or buy a home, on the hours you work, on our manager's understanding uh, of you uh, and your needs uh, and so on. Some of those things are within the control of the trust. Others depend on political decisions and tax. But to coin a phrase, every little helps. And one thing COVID's done has advanced our capacity to do smaller things in and around our statutory responsibilities, involving our communities, involving our people like this, like Health Fest. The public clapped the NHS last year. They also donated, local firms generously included. Our charity size and its ambit have grown. Under inspired leadership, it's expanded its field of operations. And one thing we celebrate now, today, as we open this month of well-being activities, is the place of charitable activity. Yes, the NHS is a statutory service. Yes, the public must be able to rely on guaranteed flows of public funds to sustain it. But in and around what we're obliged to do as a trust, there's huge scope for volunteering, for initiatives backed by donations, for fundraising opportunities. So let's today, while accepting that COVID isn't over and there are huge challenges to come, let's celebrate our healthfulness. Thank you. Nick. David, thank you for that and uh, good morning everyone uh, and good morning in particular and a big welcome to people who are joining us from our wider communities because I'm conscious that we don't just have Oxford Healthcare staff on the webinar today but uh, we will have people from the wider communities we serve and indeed people who've supported the Trust during the course of the last 12 months as David has just alluded to. Um, I joined Oxford Health uh, just before Health Fest 2020 as the first wave of COVID was coming to an end. Um, it's fair to say that the 12 months since have been challenging, challenging personally, but I'm very aware that they've been challenging for everyone working across our organisation. Um, COVID has remained with us. We've had two further waves. We're now starting to see an increase in cases again. 
and we've had to deal with all the varied consequences of the COVID pandemic. It's fair to say staff across this organisation have worked incredibly hard for a very, very long time and have proved themselves to be incredibly adaptable, flexible and innovative. I'm very, very proud of how this organisation has met the demands put upon it over the last 12 months. I'm very proud of the fact that we have been able to develop new services, the long COVID service, for example. The three provider collaboratives we're now leading for our specialist mental health services. I could go on, but we've done that at the same time as continue to meet huge demands and challenges for our services. Uh, often when we've had very few staff available due to sickness absence, due to people having to isolate, quarantine, and due to the vacancy rates we have across many of our services. People have gone above and beyond in every part of our trust, and for that I am incredibly thankful. Uh, I am very proud to lead this organisation um, and to be a member of such a great team, a team made up of people who are passionate and committed about what they do, people who care incredibly about the people who use our services, our patients, our service users, and people who are absolutely focused on trying to provide the best possible care and support to those individuals at all times. That is quite an incredible thing um, and it's something that we should never take for granted. But with these challenges and the huge efforts that everyone has made, clearly there come consequences and it's, it's fair to say that the last 12 months will have had profound effects on many people's physical and emotional well-being. And we need to be very conscious of that. We need to care for each other. We need to ensure that the emotional and physical well-being of our staff is something that we really prioritise and don't take for granted. We need to make sure that we support our colleagues as much as we can. And that's why I think this month of Health West 2021 is so important. It's incredibly valuable for us to be able to reflect and to recover. Uh, and I'm very grateful for all the efforts that the team have made to pull together such an amazing um, month of activities with so many great events um, to try and support our workforce, our amazing workforce, and to focus on their well-being. And I do hope that you will have opportunities to join some of those events during the course of September, uh, whether it be military fitness or coaching, uh, meditation or, or other events that are available. Um, I do hope that you will have some time and you can set aside that time because we should never forget the importance of looking after ourselves. One of the things I often say to uh, people who join this organisation is that when I was working in Somerset uh, a few years ago, um, someone told me that happy cows produce more milk. Uh, Somerset's a big dairy farming county. There are lots of cows and apparently this is true. Happy cows do indeed produce more milk and better milk. Um, and we also know that happy staff uh, deliver better care. Uh, so it's important that myself and David and the rest of the trust leadership team really do focus on your well-being uh, and support you. Because if we do that, we will have happy staff. We will have staff who want to remain in the employment of Oxford Health for many years to come and staff who continue to go above and beyond to deliver the best possible care uh, to those who use our services. And with that in mind, one of the things perhaps I'm most proud about over the last 12 months is the role that Oxford Health has played in delivering the COVID vaccination programme, not just across Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire, but also much of Berkshire. Uh, and that work has been led very ably by Tamir Ashmal, who you'll hear from in a minute. Uh, but the fact that our team has been able to now deliver well over half a million vaccinations, I think it's now close to 600,000 vaccinations, is a huge achievement. Uh, and something that we all should be very proud of because it has been a team effort. Lots and lots of people have played a really important role in delivering this vaccination program. And it has again demonstrated the amazing resilience, strength and innovation that exists within this organisation. And that's important because the challenges we're facing are not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, I have no doubt the next few months will be very, very difficult for us all. Um, winter is rapidly approaching and with that will become 
come further demand, further pressures on our services. So it's important we continue to innovate. We continue to use the resources available to us as effectively and efficiently as possible. And that we continue to learn from some of the great stuff that we've done during the last 12 months and how we've embraced digital solutions, for example, and how we've been able to become a more agile and a more connected organization. And the COVID vaccination program is a great example of that. So without further ado, I shall now hand over to Tamina. Tamina, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to have the next slide, please, Noosh. Um, I can't believe it's um, not quite been a year since we started the programme. I remember coming on one of Nick's webinars in January, showing you pictures of an empty space in the CASAM and how we were planning to create a mass vaccination centre out of that. I also remember spending quite a lot of time manually allocating some of our staff to the limited appointments that were available for them to get a vaccine um, at the OUH, which was our first hospital hub. But what I'd like to do is just run you through a snapshot, really, of some of our main achievements since then, which, as Nick says, has been completely astonishing. Before I go into the detail, I just want to thank my incredible programme team and the colleagues that I've been working with within Oxford Health and also across the wider system. We've created partnerships with local authority colleagues, um, with universities, with third sector, with St John's Ambulance, as well as with our health partners in primary care and the acute setting and also with social care. So for me, it's, that's one of the things that's been most astounding about this is how well we've been able to come together with a clear purpose, a common goal and really achieve something completely extraordinary. So from my perspective, it's been a real privilege to be involved in that. So some of you will have been um, in the CASAM on the week of the 25th receiving your vaccine. The first vaccination was delivered to a clinical psychologist, Madeleine Irish. Um, we managed to um, get some really good media, I think, around that. And we were delighted that Torian um, was on the front page of the Oxford Mail, um, just demonstrating um, that it was really important to get the vaccine and how pleased she was for that. And you'll also notice Nick in the bottom of the corner there um, having his vaccine delivered by Professor Andy Pollard, who volunteered to be a vaccinator for the day when we were first opening up our CASA mass vaccination centre. So there's a lot of excitement really. This was the first time we'd done anything like this before and actually it looked and felt great. There was a lot of energy and enthusiasm but primarily we were delivering a really good high quality service um, ensuring we could deliver as many vaccinations to our staff as possible. So the next slide please Noosh. In February, we started to open up our services to the public and we saw three vaccination centres in total being opened by the end of February. So the first three pictures you see on the left hand side are members of the public who came to get vaccinations. I think one of the things that really struck us was for some of these people, it had been the first time that they'd left their home since the first pandemic um, had started in March, April the previous year. And they were talking to us about what it felt like and what it meant for them to come and get their vaccination. So some really powerful stories there, which I think really moved our staff as well. We then opened a vaccination centre at Buxton University in Aylesbury and then the third one was at the Modeski Stadium in Reading and then the three of those became basically our flag flagship vaccination sites um, for a period of a few months. Can I have the next slide please? We invited a number of people to come and see our sites because we were so proud of them. So we had our High Sheriff Manwa Hussein, who I'm delighted to say has also um, provided a reward to our staff for the fantastic contribution that we've made to the community in terms of our vaccinations. We had the head of the NHS come to speak to our staff and talk to us about the importance and value of the vaccination programme in really addressing the pandemic and its, its challenges. Um, we've had a number of MPs have come to visit. We have a picture of Leila Moran there. And then also we were delighted to have um, Alan Jones come and uh, film a portion of their songs of praise um, around Easter, which had a theme of hope and spoke to um, our High Sheriff Manwa Hussein, who's also a chaplain at the OUH, and our own chaplain, Guy Harrison as well, about how the vaccination centre and how the vaccination programme was really supporting people to see a way out of the pandemic going forward. The next slide, please. Since then, we've been going strong. We've moved two sites since then. We've moved from Buxton University to the Goodman Centre, which is at the Stoke Mandeville Stadium, and from the Modeski to Broad Street Mall in Reading. We've, uh, we were absolutely delighted to be vaccinating our Paralympic and our Team GB heroes before they went to the Olympics, and that was a really exciting thing for us to do. 
Um, we were the one of the only of six sites in England who were asked to go live with that third vaccine, Moderna, and that was based on the confidence um, and assurance people had in the services that we were providing. And then from June and July, you might have started to see the van in the bottom right, right hand corner there out and about. And this is our health and health on the move van. We've got two of those and that allows us to take a vaccine out and about to communities all across Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and West Berkshire so that we can make it as easy as possible for people to receive their vaccine. The next one, please. So as Nick said, it's now over half a million, so over half a million and still going strong. Um, in the last week, we've run walk-in sites in um, Oxford, in Whitney and at Reading Festival. Um, what we've got coming up is support for extending the vaccination programme to under 18s. We've been running walk-in sites for 16 to 17 year olds over the last two to three weeks, but also working with the school immunisation team if we do end up vaccinating people who are 12 to 15 year olds. And it's also possible that we'll be supporting the booster programme for um, over 70s and potentially over 50s between now and Christmas. I suppose what I would say is it's really important for all of our staff to get both of their jabs and critically to record that so that we know that you've got them um, and so that you're ready and able to receive the booster when we start to move into that alongside our flu programme as well. So there's a lot coming up. I think autumn's going to be really busy for us. We'll be delivering vaccines and our mass vaccination centres pop up and walk-in sites across the patch and also through our two Health on the Move vans as well. So we're really excited that we continue to be a really pivotal part of this programme as we go into what's going to be one of the most challenging times of the year for us. So I just want to finish really by saying thank you again to all of the people who've made this possible, both internally, my fantastic team, the incredible vaccinators, um, and then also all of our partners across health, local authority in the third sector and the three areas that we've been working in. It's been a fantastic programme and absolutely delighted to have been part of it. Of course, vaccinations is really part of that health and well-being for staff, so I'm delighted to be able to pass over to Sophie now, who can talk a little bit more about some of the wider well-being activities that we've been undertaking at Oxford Health. Lovely, thank you, Tamina, for that. Um, my first slide, please, Mishka, if that's OK. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Sophie, and I'm really pleased to be here today on behalf of the health and well-being team. Um, my bit is going to be a real whiz through to show you how we've worked together um, for the initial part of the pandemic and what work is currently going on. Um, at a time of unprecedented challenge, in fact, probably one of the most difficult periods in NHS history, um, looking after our staff has, has never been more important than it is now. Um, our first steps were to work alongside the newly formed psychosocial response group, um, where several new initiatives were introduced to enhance the wellbeing offer for staff. Um, the initial phases acknowledged that there was a real large element of unknown for many, so it was really important to prepare staff as best as possible for what was coming. And of course, this period saw many of us working in very different ways. So creative approaches were explored to make sure that staff had support, whatever their circumstances may have been whether that be working from home, homeschooling, which I'll move on from very quickly, um, looking after elderly relatives or, or even shielding themselves. So a big thank you to our IT and HR teams who worked tremendously hard to get people up and running so quickly um, when they may not have had the necessary equipment to do so previously. Um, we had staff members and students living away from home in hotels, um, so there was a real team effort there to help coordinate hotel bookings and, and access to food, etc. Um, collaborative working was, was key and remains key in all that we do. Um, you'll be aware of the newly formed wellbeing and mental health hubs, you matter, meaning that as a trust we could provide rapid and coordinated access to support services, um, including EAP, PIPs and, and, and national offers to name a few. Um, this has been so important in being proactive, but also ensuring that appropriate support is targeted at both team and individual level when, when it's needed. The wellbeing team has also been instrumental in bidding and being awarded an enhanced occupational health and wellbeing co uh, project across the Bob ICS and, and that's what sees me in my role today um, and this is to be able to offer additional resources in our aim to create a wellness culture for all. Um, next slide please. So 2020 saw the release of our NHS People Plan and you can see from the People Promise graphic at the foot of the slide um, that staff and wellbeing is at the forefront and, and that's no different here at Oxford Health. 2021 um, has seen the beginnings of our shift towards a proactive and preventative wellness culture and um, 
we're by no means the finished project uh, product, but we are starting to see some really exciting progress. Um, May was a busy month, um, seeing the appointment of our first wellbeing guardian, Bernard Galton. Many of you will, will know Bernard as one of our non exec directors and with him being appointed, I think it really demonstrates the commitment from the trust to ensure that wellbeing is a priority at all levels. Um, in the same month, the trust was delighted um, to announce our official par partnership with EDA, the Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse, and that's supporting those facing abuse, as well as providing access to services to help perpetrators to stop. Um, in June, um, we launched the first time to talk menopause network. It's really, really well attended and that will continue with the next um, event later this month. A new and refreshed intranet site was launched aligned with the people promise again, uh, making sure it was easy to navigate and support was accessible quickly. Nationally and regionally, um, we're really heavily involved in the work around the role of wellbeing champions. We currently have around 180 champs here at Oxford Health um, that volunteer from all areas of the organisation. Um, and that role is really important to the wellbeing team, helping to share information, but more importantly, feeding, um, feeding back what the need is locally. And in support of checking in with each other, um, we have released guidance to encourage people to have wellbeing conversations. And that's not just asking how people are, but that's also truly listening to the response that's give it, uh, given. And if necessary, asking them again, how are you? Um, and a wellbeing action plan for those that would benefit from a little bit more structure to think about their own needs as well. There's a piece of work around civility and respect. Um, at Oxford Health, this is about promoting behaviours that align with our trust values and empowering people to speak up should they witness behaviours that maybe don't. Um, and finally, at the core of our trust strategy um, is making Oxford Health an outstanding place to work. So we are committed to developing and embedding a restorative just culture. Um, this month we have 17 further people attending training um, and that's to facilitate key people to help with the implementation. Um, last slide please, Nesh, thank you. So I think it's probably fair to say that it's been a rather busy 18 months and um, we all recognise that things do still remain difficult. The start of Health Fest though gives us a much needed opportunity to stop, reflect and consider what recovery looks like for us as an individual. A huge, huge thank you to Julie and the fabulous charity team for everything that you do for us and for all of the work that has gone into making this month happen. I know it's not a, an easy feat. Um, and September is conveniently also self-care month. Um, so a quick reminder to all of us that self-care isn't selfish, it's essential. So use this month to start thinking about some of those basics. Stay hydrated, eat well, take your breaks, get some exercise in, even if that's a 10 minute um, whiz around the block. Or um, if you're anything like me and after you drive home, you, you sit in your car for an extra five, sometimes maybe 10 uh, minutes before heading into the chaos of the house, then do you know what, do it. These things aren't optional, they're fundamental. Remember to look out for your colleagues too and give them a nudge to do the same. And just let's make it the norm to do these basics really well. Um, as Nick mentioned, the evidence is overwhelming that the more we look after our own well-being, the better the outcome for our patients. So I'll reiterate, self-care is not selfish. I'd like to just end by saying health and well-being, it's, it's part of the fabric of our organisation. It's not an add-on, it's not a nice to have. And I think we are really fortunate to have a senior leadership team that acknowledge and support that. So I'll leave you with lit well-being being your golden thread through everything that you do, whether that be for yourself, your colleagues, your family, friends, but also do it for your patients. Thank you. And I'll pass over to Kerry now. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, something else that has benefited hugely during this difficult time um, from both teamwork and partnership working has been Oxford Health's charity and I'm hoping that many of you here today more now more know more now than you ever had that we have a charity called Oxford Health Charity which is primary purpose is to enhance the experiences of patients carers and staff. The last 18 months like no other have been difficult for all of society and our teams of staff have worked tirelessly, tirelessly through unprecedented times and in challenging conditions. 
The huge outpouring of love and affection for staff was amazing during this period with donations and gifts coming into the charity from the local community and through um, national support via NHS charities together. And the charity team and others have done their utmost to make a positive difference during these times. And I'm hugely grateful to Julie and the small charity and community involvement um, um, team in particular for the difference that they've supported. One of the biggest developments in that period has been Oxford Health Cares Appeal, which throughout the pandemic supported staff in the form of care packs, which were just small tokens of appreciation and affection, hopefully making a big difference to um, the daily lives of staff delivering services during this period. And in that time, over 2000 packs were sourced, packed and distributed. And on top of that, we had virtual well-being sessions, which Julie will talk about in a moment, and other team activities, which also included access to green spaces for respite. Um, as we've heard throughout today's presentations, we're all immensely proud of the innovative ways that teams developed services to safeguard ongoing care during the pandemic, and the charity was delighted to support funding for some of those initiatives which included remote monitoring of long-term conditions and also digital engagements, which provided for some virtual com, um, consultations that the charity was able to support. But we've also managed to provide charitable, charitable funds to our inpatient wards across community mental health and learning disability sites, which included additional activities to engage our service users when they were suffering the loss of families um, being able to uh, visit them on a regular basis. So um, additional activities helped fill that void. None of this would have been possible without the support of our communities. And I would wish to extend a huge thank you to all those community groups, individuals, organisations and businesses that have supported us over the last 18 months. It has been truly amazing and you really have allowed us to enhance conditions for staff and service users during these difficult times. Please do continue to get involved, continue to support the charity and therefore help us to make the services that we deliver to our service users um, the best that they can be and to help us be a truly outstanding place to work and in which to be cared for. I'd like to end by inviting you all to enjoy HealthFest 2021. This is our digital innovation, virtual health HealthFest. It's our fourth HealthFest and let, here's to hoping that our fifth in 2022 will allow for a physical presence. Enjoy the month of HealthFest. Thank you and I'll now hand over to Julie. Thank you, Kerry, and uh, I'm really happy to be here to uh, launch HealthFest with you all today. Um, as Kerry's mentioned, we would love for HealthFest to be our big community event, and, and I'm hoping for 2022 that we will be back um, in person and welcoming you all to our sites and to meet our teams and talk to them about the services and the opportunities there are to be involved with the Trust. But this year, like last year, is just a little bit different um, and we're doing things to support our staff this year because that is really important to us as a charity. We know, as Nick and, and Sophie have said, that this is vital to ensuring uh, that everybody feels cared for, that everybody has that that feeling of well-being and self-care right at the forefront of uh, their lives at the moment and we're drawing on our experience of running some virtual well-being sessions earlier in the year so the charity developed a program called connect and care for you that ran uh, back in february and march during lockdown three uh, for six weeks we offered well-being sessions virtually for staff and we had an overwhelming response for those and staff said that they really felt supported uh, by the sessions and that they were able to take some time out and felt that they had permission to look after themselves whilst they had been looking after others for so long. So with that in mind and uh, the restrictions that meant that holding a big community event just wasn't going to be possible this year, uh, myself and the team within the charity and involvement team, the health and wellbeing team and our communications team have worked really hard over the last month or so to pull together HealthFest 2021. And it's a month full of sessions for staff, volunteers, governors and our executive teams to come together 
and really take some time out for themselves um, to to give themselves something back um, when actually they've given so much to everybody else. Um, there's a lot of things happening during the month and um, we're hoping that we've covered sort of everybody's interests uh, through from yoga and meditation to gardening, art, cookery, dance, fitness and coaching. And we couldn't do any of this without the amazing teams who've offered their services and supported us to deliver this. So we have Natalie and Lizzie from the Wellbeing Generation. We have Tom from Artscape, Maya from Maya's Lab, Annabelle from Life at Number 27, John from Be Military Fit, Angela from Creating with Care, Emma from Kids Yoga with Emma, and Dr Lizzie, who's providing us with an amazing origami session, um, which just keeps those hands busy and creates something really beautiful. And we couldn't do it at all without the amazing teamwork that comes together from pulling funding together and uh, pulling all of those bookings together. So a big thank you to Michelle, our development coordinator, for helping that all come to, together and, uh, and giving us the sessions that we need this month. And your support as donors and fundraisers is, is tantamount to bringing this together as well, and we couldn't do it without you. Uh, next slide, please, Noosh. If you would like to support the charity and you know, and you would like to find out a bit more about what the charity does, please do visit our website. There's lots of information on there about all the things that we are doing and we are easily found at www.oxfordhealth.charity or you can always get in touch with us. Uh, we look at our emails almost constantly um, and uh, we're on charity at oxfordhealth.nhs.uk. Um, we always welcome people who are looking to support the charity in any way that they can and uh, we will support you to make that happen. Thank you so much and I'd like to hand back to Sarah. Thanks very much Judy and to all our panellists today. There are of course many ways in which you can get involved in, in Oxford Health Life, whether that's as a, a trust member or you might perhaps want to stand as a governor in our next elections or indeed uh, join us as a member of staff. And we've actually got a, a recruitment fair this weekend, this Sunday at Abingdon Community Hospital. All this information will be uh, on slides at the end of this presentation. But now it's a chance to put some questions to our panel. Um, we have quite a few coming in, some of which have already been covered by presentations. So I will um, hand pick some questions to, to put to you now. Um, Julie, if I may start with you, as this is a, an Oxford Health charity event, uh, we've got a very successful uh, Green Spaces appeal at Oxford Health, uh, and a member of the community has, has asked, will Oxford Health continue to develop our green spaces? As a visitor, they say it's a lov lovely to, to see the, the, the green spaces when they visit their relative. Absolutely, oh, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, We've absolutely loved having our Green Spaces appeal and it's been one of the, the biggest sort of proud moments of the year that we actually delivered our Peace and Tranquility Garden in Abingdon during the pandemic. Um, it opened last August's bank holiday, so uh, it's a year old now. Uh, we absolutely will be supporting Green Spaces pro projects going forward. Um, we have several that have been proposed to us and we're working through those at the moment. Um, so please do rest assured that the charity is here to support Green Spaces moving forward. Lovely. Um, and I've also got a question here, Julie, about um, donating. Have we got any um, special information that we can share with people about donating to the charity? I know they can do this on, on the website, but this particular person's asked about um, donating via Amazon. Oh, yes, so the, the easiest way to donate is through our website, as Sarah said, um, but we do have an Amazon wish list. Um, it's something I'd never heard of before the pandemic, but a lot of charities now have those in place. Uh, so please do have a look. I believe it's on Amazon Smile um, and you can choose us as a charity and identify things that you may want to support there. Um, if you do have any problems with that, as I've said, we are checking our emails all the time. So please do email us at charity at oxfordhealth.nhs.uk and we can pick up on any issues that you may have. Um, but thank you so much for offering to donate. That's great. Thank you, Julie. And, and sticking with the charity theme, 
your website, Oxford Health Charity, I believe has, has a range of different ways in which people can, can fundraise or take part in activities. Is there any standout pieces you'd like to highlight? Well, yes, you you mentioned that uh, we actually have just opened up uh, for the Blenheim 7K. So anyone who's local to Oxfordshire will know how beautiful uh, the Blenheim Palace area is. And, and Blenheim 7K is happening on the 10th of October. Um, we're really happy to be part of it because it's a really accessible event. It's not just about a run. There is a 7K run, as you can imagine, but there's also a four mile uh, event for people with wheelchairs and buggies. And there's also a one mile event for young people to take part in. So it's a really broad event and we're really excited about that. Um, I believe we've got about 14 people taking part so far for the charity, but we'd welcome more. Um, and obviously we're looking forward to the Oxford half in October as well, which our very own CEO is taking part in for us. So uh, please do, although we don't have any more spaces on that one, uh, cheer on all those people who are running for us in October. Fantastic. Thanks, Julie. I'm now going to move to um, the vaccination programme. Some lovely responses that have been posted about um, thanking thanking our teams for all that they've done and, and recognising the success. Somebody's asked um, to Mina, will our centres be staying open uh, this winter uh, through the flu vaccination programme and booster vac vaccinations? Yes, yeah, so our three mass vaccination centres in Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and West Berkshire, we're planning to keep until at least the end of December. Um, in November, we'll see whether we need to continue them beyond that time. But we're certainly seeing the mass vaccination centres as being one way in which we'll provide um, vaccinations to staff. But you should see us coming out and about to the units where you're working as well. And we can really use the um, the uh, sorry, the COVID vaccination much more flexibly than we could this time last year. So it is possible for us to take it out and about in a way that wasn't possible before. So you'll see us both out and about offering flu and COVID booster vaccinations, but you will also have the opportunity either to come to any of our mass vaccination centres or you might be asked to go to one of your local GPs if that's easier. Thanks, Tamina. And it's worth pointing out to people that if they want to find out where our uh, walking clinics, pop-up clinics are at any given time, please visit the Oxford Health website www.oxfordhealth.nhs.uk and you will see on the on the um, front page of the news section uh, an updated, frequently updated uh, piece of information setting out where our teams are and how you can best access the vaccine, whether that's getting your first vaccine or indeed a follow-up vaccine. Um, I'm now going to move on to some health and well-being. Um, so, Sophie, I wonder if I can turn to you now. Yeah, of course. We have a question here um, asking, are there any recommended apps, places that people can go to support health and well-being? Yeah, of course. So um, one of the really good places to look is just the, the kind of main NHS website, so www.nhs. Um, I think it's dot, dot uk I've just got up in front of me and there's an apps library there and that's really good because that's all the nhs approved um all sorts of apps related to um general kind of physical health stuff but also um some kind of proactive things that can help with well-being so definitely take take a look at that if you're wanting to to find out some more excellent thank you um i'm just seeing if there are any other there's there, there's a question here which might be worth referring to and this is one for tamina now i know oxford health and the system partners in in throughout the uh, bucks ox and berkshire west uh, health system have done much to address it address this is issue it's vaccine hesitancy i wondered if you could give us a, a, just a brief overview of all the work that's gone on and continues to go on tamina Yes, thank you. So within Oxford Health, we've done a number of different things. So Sarah and her team um, keep a really good updated um, set of information on the website, the internet for staff to look at, and that really does provide a significant amount of information. But what we've also offered to do is go and talk to teams or staff individually. And certainly it's possible for anybody to have a conversation with anyone from our pharmacy team who can offer, who can offer um, a whole a range of opportunities to ask some quite specific detailed questions on the way in which the vaccine works, but also whether they've got any specific concerns um, in terms of their age or personal characteristics, which they think might be a cause for concern. 
It's also possible when people come to a vaccination centres, we're very happy if you've booked an appointment to have a conversation with you quietly um, so that you can really run through any of the concerns that you might have. And we have GPs and other medical staff available on all of our sites to enable you to ask those questions as well. Um, there is a lot of information out and about there. Um, some of it's a little bit more confusing than others. So I really would um, suggest that if you are at all concerned, do get in contact through the staff IMS website for our staff or any of our staff at the Mass Vaccination Centres or your GP and they will be really happy to talk through any concerns that you might have and give you all of the update information we have on the vaccine and the way that they went the way that it works. Thanks Tamina and one final question before I hand back to David and, and this is one for Julie um, and, and a subject that um, is very close to her heart. A member of the community has um, asked us how can I become a volunteer at Oxford Health? You're muted, Julie. I do apologise. Um, I was so eager to reply that I forgot to press my button. So we're always uh, welcoming volunteers into the trust um, and it's a really important part of uh, the work that I do within the involvement team. Uh, if you would like to find out more about volunteering, please do have a look at the trust website, but also um, contact us at volunteering at oxfordhealth.com nhs.uk and we'll be able to let you know about what the opportunities are in your local area and how to apply for those. Um, we have got a brilliant team of volunteers across the trust um, and we're welcoming them back as uh, restrictions have started to ease so it'd be brilliant to add some more new volunteers to that. Thank you for your offer. Thanks Julian and thanks to everybody for putting their questions to us today. Anything that we haven't covered we will be able to follow up later. Uh, but now I'd like to hand over to, to David for his uh, final thoughts on today's events. David. Well, thank you, Sarah. That's the end of the start uh, of Health Fest 2021. We started, you may recall, by the chief executive uh, saying that happy cattle make uh, better milk. Um, two cows in a field on a winter's night, one to the other. I don't know about you, but I'm Friesian. That's one reason why your chair is uh, not been back on a career in stand up. Um, seriously, um, mobilisation to administer the vaccine has been a tremendous uh, aspect of our work and all credit to Tamina and her colleagues. And that's only one dimension, but it's obviously been in our minds uh, in recent times. And I do hope that when the regulators and inspectors uh, arrive uh, next at the Trust, they will bear in mind the circumstances in which we did produce uh, a tremendous effort and I hope uh, give us the credit for that. Thanks to the panel for uh, taking the questions and for their presentations. Um, and of course, thank you very much again. I've said it before, but it's worth repeating to the people who've made this possible in the shape of Sarah and the communications team. Lastly, it's sometimes hard, I don't know about you, but looking around Britain, let alone the wider world this week, to accentuate the positive. Um, there's a lot of darkness out there. The news is often unremittingly bad. But I'm fortunate in being able on a daily basis to see the light. In reports that I get in meetings like today's, I get to see a great organisation in operation. The NHS, Oxford Health within it, is a force for good. It exists. Your, our staff's vocation is to help people, to give, to assist, to put others first. But here's the reason for Health Fest. To do good, you, our staff, our supporters, our governors, our communities need to be hale and hearty. We need to be well. So, <laughs> military fitness. So relaxation, yoga, art, mindfulness and origami. Thanks for your time today. Uh, hope to see you all soon and do enjoy the next month. Goodbye. <laughs>